Hey guys, today's video lecture topic is biochemistry, the chemistry of life. Please make sure you're filling in your notes organizer as you watch this video lecture. Okay. So in order to talk about chemistry, we have to first define it. Chemistry is the study of the composition, structure, and properties of matter. Remember, always pause if you need to. I'm gonna go through today's lecture topic pretty quickly. So what is matter? Not what is the matter, but what is matter? Matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. So essentially everything but energy. So why in the world are we learning about chemistry in a class called biology, which is the study of life? Throughout biology, this entire course, you're going to hear of this recurring structure versus function theme. So we can't understand the function of living things. We can't understand how they work without first understanding their basic structure, down to the very atomic level. So what is an atom? An atom is the building block of matter, the smallest unit of matter. Now within each atom, there are particles called protons, neutrons, and electrons. Um, the nucleus of an atom, the center of an atom, consists of neutrons and protons very tightly bound together. Protons are the positively charged particles, while neutrons have essentially no charge. And then in the outer shells of an atom, you're going to have electrons, and those are negatively charged. So take a second to pause on this if you need to and draw the atomic structure that shows protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, you've heard of the periodic table of elements. An element is a pure substance that cannot be broken down. Essentially, an element is an atom, okay? The properties of atoms determine where they fall on the periodic table of elements. There are over 100 known elements, and each element has a unique name and symbol. So again, the periodic table of elements is organized by the number of protons and therefore also organized by properties. The vertical columns are called groups in a periodic table and the horizontal rows are called periods. So we organize them by the number of protons and the number of protons is what determines the property of an element. So essentially the periodic table is also organized by properties, which is why you have you know metals sort of all in one location, um, gases and the liquids sort of all all together, solids all together, because they're organized by the, their properties and number of protons. Okay, we're going to break down each element block on the periodic table of elements, and you need to know what each number and symbol stands for. So at the top, you're going to find the atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. In a neutral atom, which is what we will always be dealing with in biology, this also tells you the number of electrons, because remember, protons are positively charged. So if the atom overall is neutral, you have to have the same number of electrons. So here, our atomic number is 47. Oops, sorry, the atomic number is 47, so that tells you the number of protons. There are 47 protons, but it also tells you that there are 47 electrons because you've got to have the same number of protons and electrons. The atomic mass is the number of protons and neutrons that's found in the nucleus of the atom. Remember, the, atom, the nucleus of an atom consists of protons and neutrons very tightly bound together. So basically, the weight of an atom is, is just protons and neutrons. Electrons are so tiny that they essentially have no mass. It's almost like they're just a form of negative energy. Okay, so the atomic mass is the protons plus the neutrons. So here are your atomic weights, your atomic masses. Boron is 11, carbon is 12, and nitrogen is 14. So if you know the atomic mass is 11 for boron, and you know the atomic number, the number of protons is 5, do you think you can figure out the number of neutrons? You take the atomic mass and you subtract from it the atomic number. So protons plus neutrons is 11, protons is 5. That leaves us with the number of neutrons. So the number of neutrons for boron would be 6. Okay, for carbon, see if you can figure out what the number of neutrons would be. Here's your atomic mass, protons plus neutrons. Here's your atomic number, which is protons. So for the case of carbon, there are six protons, six electrons, and also six neutrons. And then do you think you can figure out nitrogen? Number seven. Okay, so make sure you, you have filled in number nine and number 10 on your notes organizer. How do you find the number of neutrons? You take the atomic mass, you subtract from it the atomic number, that leaves you with the number of neutrons. 
Okay, chemical bonds are bonds that hold atoms, molecules, and compounds together. There are two types of chemical bonds. There are covalent bonds and there are ionic bonds. In covalent bonds, the electrons are shared between atoms. Okay, so you can see the atom here and the atom here are sharing these electrons. In ionic bonds, the electrons are given to the stronger atoms. So atoms that are oppositely charged and, electron, and have electrons that are therefore given to the stronger atom. You have a strong atom, you have a weak atom, and the weaker atom basically donates an electron. So in covalent bonds, electrons are shared. In ionic bonds, uh, electrons are given to the stronger atom. Okay, now here comes sort of a complicated subject. Molecules and compounds. All compounds are molecules, but not all molecules are necessarily compounds, and let's look at why. A molecule is formed when two or more atoms join together chemically. Those atoms could be the same, or those atoms could be different. But either way, two or more atoms, you call that a molecule. A compound is a molecule that has at least two different elements. Okay, so here's a little list over here of molecules and compounds. You tell me whether they are a molecule, a compound, or both. Okay, oxygen, diatomic oxygen, oxygen that's in the, you know, the air that you breathe, always exists as two oxygen atoms bonded together, diatomic oxygen. So two oxygen atoms bonded together fits our definition for molecule, two atoms joined together. But does it fit our definition for a compound? No, it does not fit our definition for a compound because we have two of the same elements bonded together. What about H2O? You have two hydrogen atoms bonded to an oxygen atom. Obviously fits our definition for molecule because we have three atoms joined together, two hydrogen, one oxygen. Does it fit our definition for compound? Are there two different elements in H2O? Yes, hydrogen and oxygen. So for water, it's both a compound and a molecule. Okay, I'm gonna do one more with you and then you see if you can figure out the rest. Sodium chloride, salt. You've got sodium, you've got chloride. Does that, fit, does that fit your definition of molecule, two or more atoms? Definitely, a sodium atom and a chloride atom. And then what about a compound, two or more different elements? Yes, sodium and chlorine. Those are two different elements, so this is both a compound and a molecule. So remember, all compounds are molecules. If something is a compound, it's both a compound and a molecule. But not all molecules are compounds. If they have two of the same atoms stuck together, they are just a molecule. Okay, like the oxygen. So pause on this for a second and see if you can identify the, remain, the remainders of these compounds and molecules. And then answer number 14 on your page by giving an example of a molecule that is not a compound. Okay, next we're gonna talk about reactions, and this is the fun stuff, right, reactions. So you can have physical reactions and you can have chemical reactions. Physical reactions are simply where you have a change in the state of matter. You're not producing any sort of new substance. You're not reorganizing the atoms at all. You're just changing the state of matter. So for example, melting an ice cube or crushing a can. The can properties are still the same. You're just changing its state. The ice cube is still water, whether it's you know in solid form as ice or whether it's in liquid form as liquid water. So it's still H2O. You're not reorganizing the atoms in any way. That would be a physical reaction. A chemical reaction is where you have atoms or group of atoms reorganizing themselves into different substances. So rusting, which is oxidation, okay, or combustion, which is burning. All of those things are going to change the actual properties of the material itself by reorganizing the atoms. That is a chemical reaction. So please make sure you know the difference between the two and also common examples. Okay, so chemical equations. You represent chemical equations by, or chemical reactions by writing them in a very specific way, in an equation form. Chemical equations describe the substances in the reaction and the arrows indicate the process of change. So that arrow, which we call a yield arrow, is telling you that you've gone through a chemical reaction. The atoms themselves have changed. On the left side of a chemical equation are the reactants, the things reacting. Okay, these are the starting substances. They are on the left side of the arrow. On the right side, of the arrow are going to be the products or what's being produced, okay, what's being formed from the reaction. So reactants, the things that you start with, yield in the form of a chemical reaction the products. So the things reacting yield the things that are produced. So take a minute on number 16 and circle the left side of your equation there 
and label those as your reactants. And then circle the right side of your equation and label those as your products. Okay, so on your diagram here, again, label the left side as reactants, the right side as products, and see if you can figure out what biochemical process does this chemical equation represent. Carbon dioxide and water are coming in, those are your reactants, and they're being used to make glucose and oxygen. Do you have any idea what process makes glucose and oxygen? I'll give you a hint, plants do it for us, right? They're doing it all the time, they're giving us oxygen, they're making food for themselves through the process of photosynthesis. That is the equation for photosynthesis. Okay, we represent reactions with things called energy diagrams. All chemical reactions either take in energy or release energy. Every chemical reaction has to use a little bit of energy to start, and then the reaction itself is either going to absorb energy or it's going to release energy. And energy diagrams are the way we illustrate that energy that's being either produced or used in a reaction. Okay, so you're gonna have to draw a couple of energy diagrams here. Draw and label every part of these pictures. So, like I said, every reaction takes just a little bit of energy to start. That's called the activation energy. So the activation energy is the minimum amount of energy needed for the reaction to take place, for the reaction to form products. If the reaction itself releases energy, we call that reaction exothermic. The energy is being released, it's exiting the reaction. That is an exothermic reaction. An endothermic reaction is where you have an absorption of heat energy. So the um, energy is coming into the reaction. So let's talk about each of those for a second. So this diagram on the left represents an exothermic reaction. It is releasing heat energy. Energy is exiting the reaction, which makes sense because when you look at the energy level of the reactants, what you're starting with, it's way up here. And when you look at what you end with, the energy level is way down here. So in order for the energy to be less than what it started with, energy had to have been released from the reaction. Think about this, if heat energy is being released, this uh, reaction, this chemical reaction is actually going to feel very hot in a test tube because it's producing heat energy. Okay, it's releasing heat energy. So you're left with less than what you started with. Here's an energy diagram for an endothermic reaction. So make sure you draw this under number 20, label all the parts. Okay, so again, you're absorbing energy. So what you start with, the energy level you start with is way down here, and what you end up with is way up here. So energy must have been taken into the reaction. So that energy actually comes from the surrounding environment. So if this was taking place in a test tube, it would actually make the test tube feel very cold, which is interesting. So again, pause if you need to, make sure you draw your diagrams. Okay, now we're gonna talk about enzymes, which are these special proteins that are used to do two things. They speed up reactions by acting as a biological catalyst. That, catal that word catalyst means they speed up. So they speed up reactions and they lower the amount of energy it takes for the reaction to take place. So they speed up reactions and they decrease the activation energy. Enzymes are so incredibly useful to living things because all the processes that are happening inside of your cells all the time uh, you know, would, would take so much energy just to breathe, just to function on a daily basis if we didn't have enzymes that we wouldn't be able to survive. But thankfully we have these things called enzymes that make them happen faster and with less energy and we can function on a daily basis. Okay, it does not increase how much product is made so don't get confused there. Enzymes don't like make more of the reaction take place. And the cool thing about enzymes is that they don't get used up in reactions. They can be used over and over and over again. Now, enzymes are shape specific, okay? We, we call this the lock and key mechanism because enzymes and their substrates, the thing that's being acted upon by the enzyme, fit together like a lock and key. I can't take my Chevy Trailblazer key and go up to a Porsche and try and make you know, that, that car work because it's just not gonna happen. They don't fit together, right? As much as I wanna drive that Porsche. An enzyme fits together with specific substrate, which means they are reaction specific. So the specific location where a substrate binds to an enzyme is called the active site. So substrates bind to enzymes at the active sites. It makes the pro product happen faster and with less energy. 
Here's a list of a whole bunch of different biological processes that use enzymes. Photosynthesis, cell respiration, growth, waste removal, DNA replication, and movement. Remember, they do two things. They speed up reactions and they lower activation energy. The last thing I want you to do on your notes organizer is I want you to click on this link, which I've posted in the blog, and answer the number 26 about it. This will give you a much better representation of how enzymes work, but make sure you answer all your questions so you can use your notes. Have a great day.